Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Dr. Andy Bannister is an adjunct speaker with Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Andy heads up the SOLA Centre for Public Christianity in Scotland, prior to which he was Arzim's Canada Director. Andy holds a PhD in Islamic Studies and regularly addresses audiences on apologetics, faith and culture. With the Bible under frequent attack, it's vital for Christians to be able to explain to our friends why we trust it. Encounter some amazing new evidence that shows how the gospel contains eyewitness testimony and learn how we can share this with skeptical friends. Here is Dr. Andy Bannister. Father God, once more, uh, we thank you that you are a God who is good and delights to give good, good, delights to give good gifts to His children. And we thank you uh, for the gift of break forth and being able to come here together uh, to study, to learn, to have fellowship, to worship, and pray uh, together. And we thank you for what a, for what a wonderful weekend it has been. And so, Lord, as we uh, now press on into this vital topic of why we can trust Scripture, I ask that you would, as ever, give us open ears and uh, listening ears and open hearts, and that what we learn will not just be information. It's great for us to, uh, to strengthen our confidence in what we believe, but also there would be things in here that we find ourselves thinking, yes, I could use that in a conversation uh, with a friend, uh, with a neighbor, with a colleague. Lord, ultimately, my heart in this is evangelism, and I pray that for those of our friends listening, everyone here listening today, Lord, this would have an evangelistic payoff in due course. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I have a, uh, I have a friend, several friends, in fact, you'd be surprised, uh, given some of the humor. Um, I have a friend who runs a, a network of apologists in uh, Pakistan, and uh, one of his team, let us call him Abdul uh, for, uh, for security, one of his team was on a train uh, traveling through Pakistan and traveling uh, to Lahore, one of the cities. Now, sitting opposite him in the train carriage uh, was a gentleman who looked very Muslim. He looked very, very conservative. He had the beard, he had the dress, he had the whole outfit. And as the train rattled through the, uh, the countryside, uh, Abdu felt uh, the Lord impress on him uh, that he should give his Punjabi New Testament to the man sitting opposite him. And so he looked the man up and down and thought, this ain't going to go well. And so he resisted, and the urge grew. And he resisted, and the urge grew, and he resisted. And finally, the sense that God was impressing on him that he had to give his Bible to the gentleman uh, was overwhelming. And so he struck up a conversation uh, with the Muslim man, and finally, over about half an hour, conversations take a while, uh, in the Muslim world, uh, weaved it round to a place where he could introduce the fact he was a Christian and offer the guy his New Testament. Well, instantly, the man flew into a rage. He began swearing and cursing and getting violent. He began insulting Christians and waving his fists around. And in the height of this outburst, he took the Punjabi New Testament, he tore it in two, and he flung it out of the window of the train ca- tra- carriage. Abdu backed out of the train compartment, uh, concluding, well, I got that one wrong. (laughs) About 18 months later, he was preaching at a church in Lahore. At the end of the service, they had had a time of testimony, and a young man came to the microphone and began to to give his testimony. And his story was this, that about 18 months, two years before, he'd uh, he'd been listening to the radio. He lived in a village in the countryside, and he'd been listening to to Bible radio, uh, to the Christian radio uh, program. And he'd become a Christian. But there were no other Christians in his village, none in his family. He was the only one. And so he had no support, no friends, no church, no Bible. And he began to pray that the Lord would give him the scriptures in his own language. He wanted to know more about this Jesus who he was following. One day, he's walking beside the railway line, praying. (laughs) He is hit on the head by first one and then two halves of a Punjabi New Testament. He held it up in the meeting with sticky tape around the middle, very proudly that he still had it. 
Now, what can we conclude from that story? Well, one is that uh, one is that we should wear hard hats when praying beside railway lines. Um, the other thing I like about that story, this is a sort of uh, tangential point to where we're going today, but one of the things I like about that story, it does show us uh, that, when, that when God is at work in the Muslim world, and God is at work in such a way that human beings still need to act, so Abdu still needed to have the courage to talk to his, uh, his, uh, that Muslim in the, in the train compartment, but then God stepped in and did something special. But in terms of our theme today, I, so I tell that story for this reason. It shows the importance of the Bible in many parts of the world. Many, many people, many, many secret believers, uh, many Muslims even I know, are desperate to get their hands on a copy of the Bible. It's desperately sought by persecuted Christians and by Christians uh, in the Muslim world, in the co- in communist countries. So it's a book that's hugely sought after. It's the best-selling book in history. In fact, the Bible has topped the best-seller lists every year since uh, records began, apart from one year, and I think it was 2004, when Harry Potter put the Bible into second place for one year. And then the following year, J.K. Rowling was whoop, back down here again, and the Bible was back at the top. In fact, they no longer report the Bible at the top of the bestseller list because it's boring. It doesn't count as a book for some reason when they're counting the numbers. But nevertheless, there we are. Here in the West, the Bible's influence has been hugely significant. It's affected our law. It's the foundation of much of our culture, our music, our art, all kinds of things. In fact, Western civilization would not be what it is without the influence of the Bible. Yet that potency and that influence aside, today the Bible is coming under attack like uh, like never before. Many of my skeptical friends want to attack, uh, ridicule, or tear it to pieces. How can you trust the Bible? Many of our atheist friends love to ask. People like Richard Dawkins regularly attacks the Bible. He calls those of us who believe in the Bible died in the wool faith heads. What a charming compliment. Thank you, Richard. So really, my question this morning is how do we respond to that? How do we answer the skeptic? How do we push back a little bit? Well, there are numerous ways uh, we can respond uh, to that particular question. To why trust uh, the Bible? Well, this morning I want to particularly focus on a historical approach uh, because it's my academic background. So we're going to dig into some history uh, together this morning. But before we do that, before we really dig into the good stuff, um, three points uh, that I think are worth making right at the beginning as we reflect on this question, why trust the Bible? First is a really obvious question. When someone says to you, oh, why trust the Bible? Interesting question to ask back, why not trust the Bible? Why not trust the Bible? What's your reason for not trusting it? You see, you only doubt something if you have something more solid to believe in. So what is it that your skeptical friend is believing in such that they can stand on it and reject the Bible? You see, simply being a skeptic for skepticism's sake is utterly pointless and gets nowhere. In fact, if your friend turns out to be somebody who believes in being a skeptic for the sake of being a skeptic, you can say to them, well, why not be skeptical about your skepticism? Are you sure you're a skeptic? Who says? On what authority? So in other words, turn the question around. What's your reason for doubting it? Try and get to the real issue. Secondly, lots of people have bought into popular misunderstandings and assumptions uh, about the Bible. So if somebody says to you, the Bible is not reliable, again, get to the specific. Ask them to be specific. What do you mean not reliable? Why is it not reliable? What's the particular issue that you have? Now, one of two things will happen. Either they'll quote you something particular, or they'll say, well, I saw read Richard Dawkins, and he said it wasn't. Okay, well, that's not really good enough. That's secondhand skepticism. And secondhand skepticism doesn't smell very fresh. It's like goat's milk. It goes off very quickly. Get your own skepticism. Go and actually read the Bible, and then by all means, come to me with your question, and uh, we can engage with it. What's the reason for your skepticism? What are you doubtful about? And then thirdly, it's worth observing that one of the reasons, one of the big issues, I think, that many people have with the Bible is that it's old. If you talk to people, they'll say things like, how can you trust a 2,000-year-old book? It's old. It's ancient. Well, there's a problem. That's chronological snobbery. Just because something is old doesn't make it less true. I turned 40 last year, so I feel this even more so now. Just because you're old doesn't mean you are no longer reliable. You might be a bit slow and doddery, but still. And so the Bible, just because it's old, doesn't mean it's not reliable. For goodness sake, in philosophy, Plato, who founded the whole of Western philosophy, is well over 2,000 years old, and you don't find philosophers going, well, we can't trust a thing Plato said because he's ancient. That's chronological snobbery, and that underpins a lot of what people think about the Bible. And if that's the issue, you need to call them out on it and uh, and, uh, remove that assumption. So those issues aside, though, let's talk about history for a moment. The historian and the Bible. 
Why trust the Bible? Why, why trust it? What are good reasons we can give to our sceptical friends? Well, most people are not aware that historians take the Bible pretty seriously, especially the New Testament. Historians take the Bible, especially the New Testament, very, very seriously indeed. In fact, the Bible has been subjected to, some, uh, to more uh, literary criticism and more uh, study than almost any other scripture. In fact, certainly more than any other scripture. Listen to these words from uh, liberal theologian Hans Kuhn. He is, uh, he is a Christian, but he's not an evangelical, so uh, he's not necessarily a completely sympathetic voice. But the point he makes is a very good one. He writes this. He says, has any of the great world religions outside of the Jewish Christian tradition investigated its own foundations and its own history so thoroughly and impartially? None of them has remotely approached this. The Bible is far and away the most studied book in world literature. Very powerful quotation and very true. My PhD is, is in Islamic studies. The Quran has not been subject to even remotely the level of criticism that the Bible has been. The Bible has been subjected to all kinds of study, all kinds of questions, and has emerged largely unscathed. Now, interesting thing is this, when you approach the Bible historically, so this morning I'm not going to treat the Bible as we talk as a, as a special sort of book because I'm a Christian. I'm not going to say, well, we trust it because I'm a Christian. I'm now asking the question, why, would, why, can, why can a skeptic, someone who's got no Christian faith, begin to take the Bible seriously? And I'm going to treat it as we would any other historical document this morning. And when you do that, when you treat the Bible for a moment like a historical document, things get very, very interesting. You can subject it to a number of tests. In fact, there are three tests that historians generally use to, uh, to determine whether the book they are looking at, the document they are looking at, uh, has, a, has veracity, whether it's true. There is something called the bibliographic test. Uh, there is something called the internal test. And then thirdly, there's the external test. I'm going to walk us through these this morning, explain what these are, show how we can apply them to the Bible, and then show how they come up positively and uh, give us every reason we can trust the Bible and, and suggest to our sceptical friends they ought to take it seriously. Let's begin with the uh, bibliographic test. What is the bibliographic test for those of us who are not historians? Well, the bibliographic test looks at the manuscripts we have for the Bible, and it asks a very simple question. Is the text of the Bible that we have today the same, more or less, as the original? Can we trust the text that we have? Well, here's the interesting thing. There are literally thousands upon thousands of ancient manuscripts of the Bible. We have, uh, we have an embarrassment of riches, uh, manuscripts that date from the early 2nd century down to the Middle Ages. When you compare, in fact, what we have for the Bible with what we have for other ancient works of literature, it's quite frankly staggering. If you look at things like the works of Plato or the Greek writer Thucydides, it's absolutely stunning. For the Bible, we have 5,000 Greek manuscripts. We have hundreds of papyri. We have almost 350 Syriac copies of the Bible, most dating to the 400s AD. On top of this, virtually the entire New Testament. If we took every manuscript we have and we set fire to it, we could still reproduce the New Testament from quotations in the early church fathers writing in the first few centuries of the Christian era. 32,000 such quotations have been documented before AD 325, the Council of Nicaea, for those who know your church history. It's astonishing. Many of these manuscripts we have for the Bible are staggeringly early. For example, the uh, picture on the screen behind me is something called the John Rylands Manuscript, known as P52. And that dates back to approximately AD 120 and contains a portion of the Gospel of John. That is staggeringly early. Or we could talk about something like Codex Sinaiticus, uh, which uh, dates to about AD 350 and contains virtually the entire New Testament. I remember visiting the British Library in London about six or seven years ago and seeing this document. They had it there separated from me by a sort of centimeter of glass and it was the most astounding experience to stand there just on top of this thing looking at this going this is an amazing uh, Christian artifact and you really felt that you were in touch uh, with history. Manuscripts like these are hugely important because they enable us to be confident that the text we have today is the same as the text in the original and if that's not the case we're in trouble. But the manuscripts are so good, the evidence is so good, that we can be confident that the Bible we have today is the same as the original. It is accurate. We can trust it. Well, so what, says the skeptic. Fantastic. The Bible has been transmitted accurately. The manuscript tradition is wonderful. The text today is the same as the text then. But the problem is, says the skeptic, it's still not reliable. And so we come to the second test I talked about, the internal test. 
for a document's truth, a document's veracity. What we can do with that test is that we can, as historians, we can look at the document in front of us and we can ask, does this document, this ancient document, look like it was written by eyewitnesses? Because, of course, in the Gospels, that's very important. For those, for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four accounts of the life of Jesus, a hugely important question is, have we got eyewitness testimony? Or have we got something that was made up decades after the events by people who didn't know what they were talking about? Well, when it comes to the Bible, and especially the New Testament, things get very, very interesting indeed when you look inside the Bible. Firstly, we have multiple witnesses. Most of our sceptical friends are not aware that the Bible is a, is a library rather than a book. Most of our friends think the Bible is one book because we talk about it in the singular, the Bible. But of course, if you stop and think about it for a moment, the Bible is actually a library, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. 39 different books in the Old Testament, 27 different books in the New Testament. It's a library, it's not a single book. It's also got multiple authors writing in it. So when it comes to the New Testament, for example, we don't just have one person telling us about the life of Jesus. In fact, critical, critical scholars excuse me, would say we have six streams of tradition, six voices, six authors that we can identify in the New Testament who take us back to the life of Jesus. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll be familiar with those, the gospel writers. Q, that fifth source, is a source that um, some scholars think was used, an early source used by both Matthew and Luke when they wrote, and it's independent of both of them. And of course, we have Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was in touch with very early traditions about Jesus. All of those sources we have for the life of Jesus. Jesus, and they are all very, very early. Very, very early. You can date the Gospels uh, well into the first century. Most scholars date the Gospels to the 60s, 70s, and 80s AD. Some would argue that Mark is even earlier. Uh, one, uh, one New Testament scholar in the UK, who's an atheist New Testament professor, believes that Mark was written in the late 30s, and that argument is beginning to gain some ground. Another very important early witness, of course, is Paul. Paul wrote his letters between A.D. 48 and A.D. 65, very, very soon after the life and death of Jesus. He's writing within a lifetime of the eyewitnesses. When Paul is writing, the people who saw Jesus, those first apostles, are still alive and able to give eyewitness testimony. And all of this gets historians very excited, because a number of things make historians very excited. One is early testimony. And the other is multiple testimony. If we can get early, early, early witnesses for things, brilliant. If we can get mo multiple people who are very early, it gets even better. Historians start jumping up and down in their tweed jackets and getting very, very excited uh, indeed. Let's return to the Gospels, though, for a moment. Not merely are they very early. Not merely are they very early, but it is also fairly universally accepted in critical studies that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were trying to write history. In terms of genre, to use a literary term, the Gospels are historical biography. Listen to these words from New Testament scholar uh, David Orne. He writes this, he says, describing the, the, the genre of the Gospels, he says, bios, or ancient biography, was firmly rooted in historical fact rather than literary fiction. Thus, while the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, clearly had an important theological agenda, the very fact that they chose to adapt Greco-Roman biographical conventions to tell the story of Jesus indicated, and here's the key part, indicated that they were centrally concerned to communicate what they really thought happened. Whatever else we can say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John believed they were writing history. They believed they were writing biography. They were trying to tell us what they thought happened. They were not writing historical fiction, for example. But, says the skeptic, and the skeptic always has a but. Actually, rephrase that. That didn't come out very well. Um, <laughs> Even if, the, even if the gospel writers were trying to write history, says the skeptic, even if they were trying to write history, how do we know that they got it right? How do we know that they weren't fundamentally incompetent? How do we know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not a bunch of dribbling lunatics who couldn't string a, a historical argument together? Perhaps, yes, they were well-intentioned, but actually they were fundamentally incompetent. Listen to the words of one of the leading skeptics of the Bible writing today. This is a gentleman uh, called Bart Ehrman, who has write, written a number of uh, highly critical works attacking the Bible and has regularly got his books onto bestseller lists. Listen to what he says about the Gospels. He writes this. Who, says uh, Bart Ehrman, was telling the stories about Jesus? In almost every instance, it 
with someone who had not known Jesus or known anyone who had known Jesus. What do you suppose happened to the stories over the years as they were told and retold, not as disinterested news stories reported by eyewitnesses, but as propaganda meant to convert people to faith, told by people who had themselves heard fifth or sixth or nineteenth hand? He goes on. Did you or your kids ever play the telephone game? at birthday parties. Imagine playing the telephone game not among a group of kids of the same socioeconomic class, from the same neighborhood, and at the same age, speaking the same language, but imagine playing it for 40 or more years in different countries, in different contexts, in different languages. What happens to the stories? They change. Very powerful uh, couple of skeptical paragraphs. And uh, you get the power of the illustration there. Who's played the telephone game at some point in the past? Or seen? So the telephone game, for those of you who are not aware of children's party games, come on, get with the program. Uh, you line a group of small children up, and uh, in, the, in the ear of the first child, you whisper a sentence, and then the first child whispers it to the second, to the third, to the fourth. And of course, by the time it gets to the tenth, eleventh, twelfth child, the message has got completely and utterly mangled and corrupted. And Bart Ehrman is claiming, well, that's what's going on with the Gospels. People are telling each other like this, it's going down the line, and by the time it gets to the end, it's been entirely corrupted. And he says, of course, the Gospels were written far away in time. They were, they were written far away geographically. There were decades between the life of Jesus and the Gospels, and there were hundreds of miles sometimes between Palestine, where Jesus lived, and where the Gospels uh, were written. How can we trust them? Well, let's begin by admitting he has a point about the time and geographical separation. There is indeed 30, 40, maybe 50 years uh, for John uh, standing between the life of Jesus and uh, the recording of the Gospels. Now, that's quite a time gap. And what about where the Gospels were written? Well, again, potentially Bart has a point here. Uh, here's, a, here's a map of the ancient world. And according uh, to tradition, where were the Gospels written? Well, according to tradition, Mark is uh, written up there in uh, Rome. Uh, Luke was written in Antioch, or possibly Achaia, or possibly Rome, and uh, John was written uh, over there in Ephesus, all of which are quite away from Palestine uh, in the bottom right-hand corner. So the consensus is, most people would agree, yeah, okay, the Gospels were not written in Israel, they were not written in Palestine. Okay, Bart's got a point about geographical separation. So here's the question. If the Gospels were written some years, a few decades, after the life of Jesus, and if they were written some distance from where the events took place, where did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John get their information from? Did they get it from eyewitnesses, or did they simply report what they thought had happened? Did they make it up, or were they standing at the end of a very long game of telephone? Can we trust the Gospels? Well, the exciting thing is we can put the Gospel writers to the test. We can put them to the test. You see, here's the thing. If the gospel writers are making things up, or if they stand at the end of an extremely long game of telephone, then we would not expect them to contain detailed, accurate information. Imagine I was going to sit down and write a story that takes place shortly after the founding of the city of Edmonton. Imagine I'm going to write a historical novel set in 1850. Well, even with Google... Even with Wikipedia, the sum total of all ignorance on the internet, I am probably going to make a mistake. I might get names wrong. I might get facts wrong, such that somebody who really knew the information could go, ah, you've given away the fact that you don't know what you're talking about. Like, I'm British. Of course I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You guys who laughed, you wound me. Um, <laughs> The gospel writers have this problem, though. It's interesting. The gospel writers are writing before the internet. They're writing before Google. They're writing before large public libraries. They're writing before newspaper archives. They don't have access to half the stuff we have today. So we can do something interesting. We can look at the gospels and we can ask this question. Do they give us accurate information about things like uh, agriculture and architecture and botany and culture and economics and geography and language and law and politics and religion, social stratification? the weather, all of these things, we can compare what the Gospels tell us, and then we can compare them with what we know of first century Palestine from other historical sources, um, and we can ask ourselves this question, do the Gospels get the information right? I want to do that in two ways this morning. I want to do, run two tests on the Gospels to see how accurate they get the information about the historical context right. I want to run something, demonstrate something called the test of personal names, and the test of geography. Now, those sound a little bit technical, uh, but they're fairly straightforward. Let me explain the first one. The test of personal names. What do I mean by that? Well, here's the interesting thing. The names that people pick for their children 
are fascinating things. People tend to be fairly conservative. There are always stupid celebrities around, people who name their children things like Moon Unit and Diva Thin Muffin, as uh, Frank Zappa did to his poor kids, or Peaches Geld Off, or goodness knows whatever. Most people are far more sensible. Most people uh, tend to follow convention. Now, conventions change, of course, and so names come and go in popularity. So here, for example, are the, t are the most popular boys and girls' names uh, in the USA. I'm afraid I couldn't get the data for, for Canada. Your census records are not quite online in the way the Americans have done. Uh, possibly you've got your time to do better things on your hands. Um, here we are, the most popular boys' names and girls' names by decade in the USA, going back to the 1960s. So you can see in the 2000s, uh, it was Jacob, and then it was Michael, all the way back to the 1960s. Have we got anybody called Michael? Michael here. Got a few. Interesting. There's always a few Michaels in any audience because it's a popular name. For girls, a bit more variety. Emily uh, sort of dominated the noughties, uh, and then it was Jessica in the 90s and the 80s, Jennifer in the 70s, Lisa in the 60s. Now, what's interesting, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, in fact, one in 20 people was called Michael. It was a very, very common name. In fact, you can track the popularity of Michael back through history. For those of you who've got a good view of the uh, overhead here, uh, you can look at the popularity of Michael. It kind of bounced along uh, throughout the 1880s up to the 1930s. Not really that popular. Then suddenly, some Something happened in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Everyone was calling their child Michael. Woof! It leaps right up like a dangerous ski slope, and then it kind of bounces along at the top like a, like one of the Rocky Mountains, and then it's beginning to crash back down again, and it's and it's going out of popularity. Names change in popularity. That was true in the ancient world as well. In the ancient world as well, names came and went in popularity, and uh, so we can ask an interesting question: Did the gospel writers? get the names right. Again, think of my historical Edmonton novel example. Imagine I'm going to write a novel set in Edmonton in 1850. What names would I pick for my characters? How could I possibly find out what were the names that people were calling their kids then? There, there were no census records. I guess I could probably go back and find burial records and pull all this stuff together, but it hasn't been done yet. No one's done that work for, uh, for, for this part of the country. It would be hard going. And that's with modern tools. How on earth would I do it for the ancient world? Well, where did the gospel writers get the names right? So very, very interesting when it comes to ancient Israel. In 2002, an Israeli, uh, excuse me, an Israeli scholar called Tal Elam did a very interesting project. She uh, published a database of the recorded names of every Jew that we know of who lived in Palestine between AD 330, between 330 BC and AD 200. She catalogued uh, burial inscriptions, references in documents including the Bible and Josephus and the intertestamental literature, every source she could find. She bought this huge database of names, the Dead Sea Scrolls and Places. That database is, say, over 3,000 names, and that now means scholars have a really good idea what Jews were calling their kids uh, in that period, that period of time in which Jesus lived. We can look at the frequencies, we can see what names were popular. Now what's particularly interesting is that the names that Jews in Palestine were using were different from the names that Jews were using in, in Egypt. We can see distinct differences. Just go to the next country over and the Jewish community in Egypt was picking different names. Why is that important? Well, a British New Testament scholar called Richard Borkham had a clever idea. He went, well, now we've got this great database of 3,000 names. Why don't we compare it with the Bible? Why don't we compare it with the New Testament? Does the go do the Gospels get the names right? Do the Gospel names match the pattern of names that we know that was being used in the period? Well, the results of that comparison are absolutely striking. Now, this is going to be too small for most of you to see, hence why you need the PowerPoint, but I will go through the salient features very, very quickly. What's interesting... It's the most popular Jewish name in the period, according to Josephus, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, according to burial inscriptions, according to all kinds of other bits and pieces, all the data we can get from that period, the most popular name was Simon. That also happens to be the most popular name for male characters, male Jewish characters on the pages of the Gospels. Same happens with the second most popular name. According to our other sources, our extra-biblical sources, the second most popular Jewish name in the time of Jesus uh, was Joseph. And again, the New Testament matches. There's a lot of data in that table, so let me simplify it like this. In the first century, in first century Israel, according to all the inscriptions and sources we can dig up, 15.6% of men were called Simon or Joseph. They were not a particularly original bunch back then. In the New Testament, 18.2% of Jewish men bear that name. 
Uh, in total, 41.5% of men in the first century, uh, first century Israel bore one of the nine most popular names. For the Bible, it's 40.3%. It's almost exactly the same. It's a staggering match. And it's an overlap that we find in all four Gospels. This is true if you look at Matthew. It's true if we look at Mark, if you look at Luke, and if you look at John. It's also true in Acts. It's staggering to see how the Gospel writers got the frequency right. How they did that is beyond me. I mean, one possibility, I guess, is that, you know, kind of Matthew worked out this would be a very clever idea to confuse later historians, and he weaves it into his gospel, and he sticks it on his Facebook page. Mark reads it, actually the other way around, because Mark wrote first. Mark does it, Matthew reads it on Mark's Facebook page, Mark does it, and Mark tweets that, uh, Matthew tweets the fact that he's done it. Luke reads the tweet, and he does it, and, uh, and then John, I don't know, hears about it kind of secondhand in a coffee shop in, in Jerusalem or something. And so it spreads from gospel writer to gospel writer. Clearly ridiculous. But it's very hard, uh, if you're a sceptic, to go, how do you respond to that? It's a very close overlap. It's even more interesting. I mentioned that the names for Jews in Egypt were different in the first century from Jews living in Israel. We know that from that database. Here are the top seven uh, names for Jewish men living in Greco-Roman Egypt around the time of Christ. Uh, we have number one, Eleazar, uh, Sabbatius, Joseph, Docetius, Pappus, Ptolemaeus, and Samuel. I wonder how many of you here know anybody called Sabbateus? Anybody here got a friend called Sabbateus? Anybody got a mate called Ptolemaeus? Anybody know a Simon? Anybody know? A few hands. Thank you. You can talk to me. You can be interactive. It doesn't hurt. Seriously. I'm British, but I'm not scary. What's interesting is why you know people called Simon and why you don't know people called Ptolemaeus. The reason is simple. The Gospels, from which we have got a lot of our names in the West, they were not written about men living in Egypt. They were written about men living in Israel. The names were different, and the Gospel writers knew that the names were different and didn't use the names for Jews in Egypt. They used the names used by Jews written in Israel. How did they get the names so precisely right? How did they not make some spectacular mistake? Very, very interesting question. And it gets more interesting, too. Not only did the gospel writers get the uh, frequency of names right, they get the features of names right. What do I mean by that? Well, I said in the first century that many, many, many Jews had the name Simon. In fact, if you yelled, Simon, in a crowded room, half the, audience, half the congregation would stand up. That's very confusing. How do you find the right Simon? You walk into a crowded uh, taver taverna, you yell, Simon, looking for your mate, and 20 people turn towards you. Well, how do you do it? You have to distinguish Simon from Simon. In the first century, you could do a number of things. And the way you did it is you added little uh, uh, inscriptions, little um, uh, epithets to the end of the name. You could mention the father. You could refer to perhaps Simon, son of John. We find that in the Bible. You could mention the son. Uh, uh, you mentioned the trade, rather, Simon the Tanner. You could mention a nickname, Simon the Leper. A somewhat unfortunate nickname, it has to be said, not to be shaken. Don't, don't shake hands with that gentleman. And um, you could mention the uh, place of birth, Simon of Cyrene. You could use all of those methods. That was how it worked in the first century. And it's interesting that gospel writers know that, and they use all of those methods. But here things get even more spectacular in terms of what goes on. Here is Matthew's list of the 12 disciples. Matthew's list of the 12 disciples of Jesus, uh, taken from Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4. What I want you to look at, and again, hard to see on this screen at a distance, but you'll get the idea. Wherever a qualifier is used for a name, we have Simon, called Peter, we have James, the son of Zebedee, we have Matthew, the tax collector, we have James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Canaan, Judas Iscariot. Iscariot is probably the place, the town that Judas came from. Every time... But Matthew uses a little qualifier that, like that. The name that has the qualifier is in the top 11 names for the people, for, for men in Israel. Other, in other words, there will be lots of Simons, lots of James, lots of Matthews. People would go, well, which James do you mean? Which Simon are you talking about? And he has to tell us. However, for the least popular names, that's not an issue. One in 50 people was called, Bar uh, uh, the fifth, sorry, Bartholomew is the 50th least popular name uh, in Israel. You didn't need to say which Bartholomew. You didn't need to say which Thomas or which Thaddeus. Those were not popular names. Probably they were pretty unusual. How does Matthew know where to put the qualifier and where he can miss it out? 
It is a staggering level of precision. Absolutely staggering. If Matthew is writing his gospel decades from the events, miles from the events, making it up as he goes along, how on earth can he get it that right with that degree of accuracy? You see, names are fascinating things. We tend to forget names and remember facts about people. That's a very common occurrence. Maybe you've had that occurrence, that you run into someone at Breakforth that you met last year, and you go, oh, hello. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I can't remember your name. Um, That happens to me all the time. So if you come and talk to me afterwards, and you have met me earlier this weekend, I will look at you blankly. Movies demonstrate this. Perhaps you've had the experience where you go and see a movie, and you're describing it to a friend the next day, and you can describe the the, the incident, but you can't say the name. You, You say, oh, I went and saw that amazing James Bond film. I saw Skyfall, and there was wonderful stunts, and the, the bad guy sort of died spectacularly in this really amazing gross way and your friend goes what was the bad guy called I can't remember I can tell you the way that he died and gore was all over the screen it was um, not very nice but I can't tell you what his name was we remember facts but we forget names that seems to be the way the human brain is wired well here's the interesting question if the gospels get right the thing that is the hardest to remember they get the names right how much more can we trust them that they, they get the easy things to remember right if the gospels are able to get the names right I suspect we can trust them when they tell us about big things like Jesus being crucified and rising from the dead. That's a rather big thing. And uh, the gospel writers get the names right and therefore we can trust them on the big things. Now that doesn't prove the gospels are true. You can't prove mathematically that something is historically true. But it does show us that the gospels contain all of the features we would expect of eyewitness testimony. It suggests it has the smell of eyewitness testimony. That they are talking to people who knew the people that they're talking about, knew the names, and thus are able to get them accurately accurately reported when they're written down. That's the test of names. We can do a similar thing uh, more quickly when it comes to geography. We can do a similar thing when it comes to geography. We can do what I call the test of geography. You see, people's knowledge of distant places, places they've never visited, is often a little bit sketchy. So, for example, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine uh, and I were in Starbucks in, uh, in Phoenix in Arizona. Very, very warm, not like Edmonton. And uh, we, were, we were drinking coffee there, and we got talking to the barista. And she looked at my friend, who's Canadian, and uh, she said, oh, where? that's an interesting accent, she said to Rick. She said, where, where are you from? And he went, oh, I'm from, I'm from Toronto. There was a very long, embarrassing silence, after which my colleague thought he would help the barista out. And he went, that's, uh, that's in Canada. To which she said, oh, Canada, that's, that's a couple of hundred miles north of here, eh? She didn't say A, actually. Um, so, which we had to say, um, you're off by a factor of, uh, a factor of what, yeah, try, try, try a thousand miles at least. Um, she didn't know where Toronto was, she didn't even know where Canada was. She knew nothing about it because she'd never been there. And uh, what about the Gospels then in geography? Do they commit similar howlers? Are there similar geographical mistakes on the pages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, here's the interesting thing. Place names are found throughout the Gospels. In fact, dozens of place names are found throughout the Gospels, ranging from major cities like uh, Jerusalem and Jericho to tiny villages uh, like Cana, Chorazin, and Nazareth. That alone is very interesting. If I was to ask you today, if I was going to pick on someone at random, probably on the front row to serve you right for sitting there, and say, can you name me somewhere in France, probably most of you would get Paris fairly easily. But how many of you could begin to name tiny villages out in the rural parts of the country? How many of you would be able to name those kind of places? Would you manage the small cities and towns? Well, the gospel writers do. They get the big cities, they get the small towns as well. On top of this, the gospel writers know all kinds of interesting geographic detail. They know the distances between places. They know which places are on the roads and which are in the backcountry. They know where the hills are. Uh, They know how long it takes to travel between places. They know which places are on the coast. They know which places are on the lake shore. Lots of geographical detail in the gospels that is pretty hard to explain if they are not based on eyewitness testimony. People who have actually been there and who know the lay of the land. Now, it's interesting when it comes to geography to compare our canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, with the apocryphal Gospels that have been popularized by people like um, 
Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code. The apocryphal gospels uh, were later fictional gospels written in the first two or three hundred years after Jesus, and uh, largely they're pious, uh, they're pious fictions, sometimes written by Christians, sometimes written by other religious groups. And people like Dan Brown and other skeptics have sort of said, well, these things are should be taken as seriously as the gospels. They're, they're, they're reliable. Well, not sure that's true, and I think we can demonstrate it statistically quite easily. The use of place names is very interesting. If you look at our four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find there are approximately 24 place names mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, from big cities to small towns and villages. When you turn to the Gospel of Philip, written in the third century, we have two place names, Jerusalem and Nazareth. One is the biggest city in the region where Jesus died. The other is Jesus' birthplace, Jesus of Nazareth. Not exactly many points for geographical knowledge there. We turn to the Gospel of Peter, mid-2nd century. Peter's even worse. One place name is mentioned, Jerusalem. That's like me naming places in, in France and not getting beyond Paris. Any fool can come up with Jerusalem, and the author of the Gospel of Peter doesn't know anything else. We then look at 13 other 2nd and 3rd century Gospels that we could collect together. Zero. Not a single place name, not even Jerusalem. That is a staggering difference. It's not just a slight difference, it's a staggering difference, astronomical difference. And it becomes even clearer when you look at the frequency with which these documents mention places. When it comes to our four Gospels, you can see them there at the left-hand end of the graph. Almost all of the four Gospels have round about, five, around about five place names per thousand words. We get to the apocryphal Gospels, and with the one exception of Peter, who insists on mentioning Jerusalem every other paragraph, Philip, Thomas, Judas, and Mary, all bouncing around about 0.1, 0.2 place names per thousand words. Staggering difference. But I want you to particularly notice the fact that four bars at the the left-hand end are all almost the same. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have a more or, more or less identical pattern of place name usage. They have the same level of place name usage. And again, we have to rack our brains and go, huh? How is that possible? Again, is it the case that Matthew gets hold of an early copy of Mark? First edition of Mark, he gets it from Barnes and Noble. And he goes through it and he counts the place names. And he goes, oh, Mark has about 5.1 place names per thousand uh, words. That's an interesting idea. I think I'll do that. And he goes away and re-edits. He's using Microsoft Word 0.1 so he can do find and replace and things. And he does the same thing. And Luke gets word of this. In fact, Luke's literary agent comes to him and goes, Luke, I'm afraid, look, Gospels really, really only sell if you've got 5.1 place names per thousand words. Do you think you could change your first draft? And Luke goes, yeah, sure. And uh, likewise, John does the same thing. Now, obviously, I'm having fun and uh, poking fun, but what is the explanation? Well, I think the explanation is something far more sensible. All four gospel writers set out to write history. All four gospel writers draw from eyewitnesses. All four gospel writers are talking to people who are putting the events in their place. And all four gospel writers use place names naturally as they do that to ground the action in the places they took place. And uh, because, of, because Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are all fairly lengthy narratives, then the averages play out and all of them end up in more or less the same place. Now, here's the thing. Many people think that the Gospels grew by slow accretion. Think of uh, Bart Ehrman and his telephone game. So the stories begin, they go down the food chain, they go down that chain of a uh, telephone, and they get utterly corrupted as they do so. That was, that's what our sceptical friends like Bart Ehrman would tell us. But the problem is this. The telephone game corrupts all details. If you play a game of telephone with a group of kids, every detail, the whole lot gets corrupted as it gets to the end of the chain. But in the Gospels, we have accurate geographical detail. We have accurate, we have accurate personal names. How on earth are we to explain that as Bart's alleged game of telephone took place, that process carefully preserved accurate detail, place names, personal names, but everything else got corrupted. How are we possibly to explain that? How is it that we've lost the big details that Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead, for example, but kept the fine details. Isn't it more likely that it should be the other way around? That that process of telephone, if it took place, should have lost things, like the names and the place names, but kept the big details. How is it that the Gospels have preserved the, the fine prints, the tiny details? How is it we can test their accuracy with mathematical precision? And when we do so, we find these kind of numbers. 
What that tells me is, once again, doesn't mean, doesn't guarantee, doesn't prove 100% that the Gospels are true. But it gives us a huge clue that the Gospels are drawing upon eyewitness testimony. And we thus need to take them very seriously. They're not making these things up, these stories up, decades after the event. It gives us a very good indicator that we have eyewitness testimony. And thus the internal test is passed. One last historical test that historians apply to ancient documents, documents like the Bible or any other, to see whether it's historical, historically reliable, to see uh, whether we can trust it. And that's the external test. And I want to spend just a few minutes here before we draw things to a close. What is the external test? Well, the external test looks at, as it would suggest, the external evidence for the Bible. Now, in the case of the Gospels and the New Testament, that is particularly archaeology. Archaeology is a very, very interesting discipline uh, for the way that it can be used uh, to verify and see whether the gospel writers knew what they were talking about. Uh, Millard Burroughs, who was once the professor of archaeology at Yale University, uh, so no slouch in the archaeology department, uh, wrote this. He said, on the whole, archaeological work has unquestionably strengthened confidence in the reliability of the scriptural record. More than one archaeologist has found his respect for the Bible increased by the experience of excavation in Palestine. Let me give you a couple of examples, and then we'll bring this to a close. Let's start with, uh, with Luke, and uh, Luke in particular Acts. Here is uh, Acts 17, verses 6 uh, through 8. I haven't got time to read the entire uh, passage. It's about the arrest of Jason and, uh, and some of the others. Uh, <coughs> excuse me there. Um, in Acts chapter 17. Well, here's, very inter- here's something very interesting. Luke uses the word politox there in the white. If you can see the screen, he uses the word politox to describe the city officials in Thessalonica uh, where uh, this incident took place. Now, the word politox does not occur elsewhere in ancient Greek literature. It's only found uh, in the New Testament. And so for a long time, skeptics uh, accused Luke of making a mistake. Luke has got it wrong. They said he's used this word, but we know from reading other historians and Herodotus and all this kind of stuff that that word was not the right word. Luke is incompetent, yada, yada, yada. Well, there was a problem uh, for the skeptics. Archaeologists discovered a first century arch in Thessalonica itself. And on that arch, and the inscription doesn't really come out on the PowerPoint, is the very term that Luke used. The word politox was found there on that inscription, showing that Luke knew what he was talking about. The same thing goes on, very similar story in Luke, uh, in Acts 18, uh, verse 12, where Luke tells us, he re- Luke tells us this little sentence. He says, while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and uh, brought him to the place of judgment. Well, again, the word proconsul couldn't be found anywhere. That word was not found in other ancient writings, other Greek writings, the Greek historians. It doesn't appear in classical literature. So again, you, you can get the pattern by now. Skeptics begin bleating. Luke doesn't know what he's talking about. Luke's got it wrong. Luke's incompetent. You can't trust the Bible. Then, uh, in the uh, early part of the 20th century, an inscription was found at Delphi in Greece, dating to AD 51. Not merely does that inscription on the screen behind me use the word proconsul, it uses the word proconsul to describe a gentleman called Gallio, the very same individual that Luke is talking about in Acts chapter 18, verse 12. Luke does not just get the term right, he gets the actual historical figure right. And again, Luke was vindicated. Same story goes on with the other gospel writers. One, um, one last example, John this time. In John 5, verses 1 through 2, the fourth gospel writer speaks of a pool in Jerusalem by the sheep gate called in Hebrew Bethesda, which has five porticos. Well, until uh, the early part, until the first few decades of the 20th century, uh, there had been lots of digging, lots of excavation in Jerusalem, and no such pool had been found. There was nothing, nothing in the archaeological record. So, once again, critics, you would have thought they'd have learned by now, begin bleating. John doesn't know what he's talking about. It doesn't exist. John's making it up. He's unreliable. Well, in the 1930s, archaeologists did a, did a dig in a different place in Jerusalem, and they found this. This is the Pool of Bethesda. Uh, it was uncovered by Archaeologists complete uh, with one, two, three, four colonnades around the outside. Oh, and another one across the middle, which makes it five. Five covered colonnades. Right, Paul, right place. John had it perfect. One final example, and it's perhaps the most intriguing. And it's something called the James Ossery. 
the uh, James Ossery. According to the Gospels, uh, the, according to the Jewish, the Jewish historian Josephus, James, uh, the brother of uh, Jesus, was killed. He was martyred in AD 62, some 30 years uh, after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Well, in 2002, an ossuary, a bone box, and the way that burial was worked in, in ancient uh, Israel is that you would put the corpse into the tomb and you would leave it for a year or two until the flesh had decayed and then you would take the bones, you'd put the bones in a bone box, an ossuary. Well, in 2002, uh, this ossuary was discovered uh, in Jerusalem. It bears an inscription in uh, Aramaic, uh, which I've blown up there for you. The inscription it bears reads as, as follows. James, son of Joseph brother of Jesus. There is extremely strong evidence that there are still scholarly debate going on, but the evidence is, is increasingly shifting towards that box and its inscription being authentic. Ed Keel of the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto uh, writes, we stand by our opinion that the James Ossery is not a forgery. As New Testament scholar Ben Witherington writes, he says, If as seems uh, probable, uh, the ossuary found in the vicinity of Jerusalem and dated to about AD 63 is indeed the burial box of James, the brother of Jesus. This inscription is among the most important extra biblical evidence of its kind. If we had more time... Uh, numerous other examples we could pull out uh, to illustrate this. And again, the point is the same as when we looked at the internal test and uh, the external te the bibliographic test uh, for the Bible. Archaeology doesn't prove that the stories in the Bible are true. You can't prove history. History doesn't work that way. Absolute 100% proof only works in mathematics. But it does show us that the gospel writers knew what they were talking about. They know the people. They know the places. They know the terms. They know the names. They know the geography. And it shows that wherever we can actually put them to the test, they come up trumps. And that thus the gospels deserve to be weighed and treated as seriously as any other text from antiquity. And that's all I ask my sceptical friends to do. I'm never saying to my sceptical friends, look, believe the Bible is the word of God. What I'm trying to say to my sceptical friends is, look, treat the Bible as you would any other ancient document to begin with. You can trust it. It's reliable on a historical level. Please go and read it and read it with an open mind. So there are good reasons then to trust the Bible. Very good reasons, we can say, to our sceptical friends to trust the Bible. Good reasons to approach it with an open mind, even if you're not a follower of Christ. On historical grounds alone, there are good reasons to treat it as seriously as we would any other ancient work and to read and weigh it seriously. So if a skeptic asks why trust the Bible, we can say a number of things. We can say that from a historian's perspective, there are great reasons to trust it. Why trust the Bible? I would say, well, only by reading the Bible can you draw your own conclusions rather than relying on somebody else's secondhand skepticism. Why trust the Bible? Because only through the pages of the four eyewitness produced biographies in that New Testament can you encounter a powerful historical figure, the figure of Jesus of Nazareth, whose story and his whose story and his life and his personality continue to resonate and influence 2000 years on. You see ultimately Ultimately, as we all know, Christian faith is not primarily based on the Bible. The Bible is hugely important, but the Bible has a particular role. And its role is to point to Jesus Christ himself, who is the centre of all of our faith. As Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. And the most important question for each one of us here this morning and each of our sceptical friends is do you know him? And as part of that process of knowing him and pointing to him, scripture can be trusted upon and scripture is reliable. But it's a pointer, ultimately, to him. Do you know him? Thank you for listening uh, so patiently. Well, we probably have time for uh, two or three uh, questions. Uh, oh, Daniel is at the back with the roving mic. So if you have a question, if there's something I haven't been clear on, which is probably quite likely, um, something you'd like to ask questions about, please not the quality of the humour. Um, we also have a special offer. First person to ask a question gets a free RZM t-shirt. So, oh, there we are. Okay, there you go. So I'm going to see if I can get this to you, and then you can ask your question. Anyone in the line of sight, I warn you, sport is not my strong point. So you're living dangerously. Here we go. Oh, not bad. <laughs> okay. 
What's your name, sir, and what's your question? My name is Chris. Chris, far away. I know that mostly questions about reliability of Bible come and center on the New Testament, but I asked a question about the Old Testament because I uh, have a friend at home who's reading his faith over the Old Testament, and he has questions about um, political agendas, about the prophets, about um, Hebraic anachronisms, about the old words, and um, he just doesn't basically believe that that is that is reliable and that's it for a great question and uh, I'm, I'm very aware that I focused on the on the New Testament because we had to kind of limit the lecture down today I would I would say uh, I would say three things uh, I'll say two things uh, number to your friend I think number one I would be saying to your friend has uh, has he or has, has she, is it he or she by the way he has has he actually gone out and read the evidence on the other side because there is there are numerous good scholarly books and um, if you want to drop us an email uh, we can take, I can give you my email address afterwards we can point you in the direction of, of some great some great resources uh, for that it tends to be specific to the question that's one reason I focus on the Gospels but if you go for the Old Testament there's the quest, quest, questions about Moses questions about the prophets questions about the patriarchs and to try and narrow it down uh, to one lecture is, is tough but there are some wonderful resources out there and so the first thing I'd say is has he read that and engaged uh, with that or again is he fueling the skepticism by reading the skeptical stuff and not reading the stuff on the other side there is always a debate anyone who tells you there's only one opinion I always say is not only telling you half the story there is a debate and a discussion but secondly the other thing I would say and be careful to hear me care hear me carefully on this because I can some this ca- this could be misinterpreted and then I'll be shot for heresy it's not that the Old Testament isn't important it's hugely important but I, the reason I ended the Christ is hugely significant. If Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be, then he is the lens through which we have to read the Old Testament and the earlier parts of Scripture. What that means is you take someone like Abraham and the patriarchs, we are not going to get archaeological evidence for Abraham. It, it ain't going to happen. You're not going to come across some dig in the Middle East and go, oh gosh, look, here's Abraham's tent pit from where uh, you know, God appeared. It's not going to happen because he was a wandering nomad. So really, when it comes to those stories... You can ask a couple of things. You can ask, are the details correct? And largely they are. Abraham's interesting. We had skeptics for a long time got very excited about Abraham using camels. And we're trying to argue that, oh, camels weren't domesticated by the time of Abraham. Now it's now complete nonsense. We know that they are from numerous other sources. Um, and so similar th- things like that you can ask. But beyond there, we don't, have, we don't have the information. We just have clues. So really it comes through, can I trust Christ who takes these things seriously? And if the answer is yes, and I think the, reason for, the reasons for trusting Christ are phenomenal. The evidence for the New Testament is spectacular. If we had time, we could talk about the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, which is off the scale in terms of impressive to go well that gives me a lens through which I can trust the Old Testament so yes it is good enough for me that Jesus trusts it now that doesn't mean we then bracket the question off and say we don't go there we can engage in the discussion but your friend has to engage in the discussion so number one is he willing to read both sides of the discussion and weigh the evidence and secondly is he really committed to Christ because that's what it's all about if the simple question is if Jesus rose from the dead then we should follow him as Lord and Christ and wrestle through the questions and by all means wrestle with them the Christian walk isn't promised to be something that's easy yes we'll have questions yes we may have doubts but the primary question for me is is jesus trustworthy and we start from there so i hope that helps but if you take my email at the end i can there are one or two beginning resources i can recommend for the old testament okay I've, uh, there are more t- i have another t-shirt oh, you're right at the back <laughs> someone may have to pass this back to you because i can't hit you from there so can someone chuck this backwards there we go thanks hi david how do you respond to the tough questions around uh, a true global flood in the Old Testament, or sorry, yeah, Old Testament, or uh, the ages of, of some of the people who published it? Yeah, oh gosh, two questions for the price of one. So um, the global flood and the, and, the, and the ages. Again, there are, there, there are, there are different ways of, uh, of doing that. Uh, and so in, in one sense, it depends on who I'm talking with. Um, so I, th- I think, for example, in the case of the ages of the patriarchs, there are two ways you can do it. One is that you can run the argument uh, that the further away you get from the fall, as the effects of the fall work through, the human, the human lifespan contracts. There is definitely a pattern in the graph going, going down as you go through. Or you can go the approach of saying... And I know other evangelical scholars who go this way of saying in the ancient world that we're reading those numbers as Westerners. And when you put a large number on somebody, one of the problems is that that's often a way in ancient literature of saying he was very, very old. 
And so we in the West tend to read the numbers specifically, whereas in ancient, ancient Near Eastern world, nobody would have looked at Methuselah's age and gone, oh, that literally meant he was that many, that many years old, because that wasn't how it worked. And, what, and that exposes, wherever you stand in that discussion, it exposes a problem, particularly with the Old Testament. We have to remember, with both the New and the Old Testament, but especially the Old, that we are reading not just through time but across culture. And one of the biggest mistakes that I think we make as Christians, or two mistakes we make as Christians, number one is we, we read the Bible as if it was personally written to us, and that's why God wrote it. Actually, that wasn't the case. God wrote it primarily to the, initially to the original audience, and then to all Christians, all times. But then also we forget that it's written in a culture. And so we just read, we sometimes flick through the Bible as if we can read the meaning off the surface of the text. And sometimes it's not that straightforward. Hey, we have to do hard work. I know that's very unfair, but you can ask God about that one. And so I think on some of these issues, it's a case of simply getting a good commentary and looking through the issues. And I'd say the same for the flood. I think if you get yourself one, of, you get yourself a really good commentary on a, on a, on the old on Genesis. I'm, I'm thinking of, there's, there's the one by Wenham, for example, in the new, in the new international commentary in the Old Testament series. is very very good because that will set out for you the different options and where they are. And say so on the flood, there's a range of positions uh, that you can take and a range of ways that people have, have, have wrestled with that question. But rather than set them all out now, I would say invest in a really good commentary and do the work and think it through. Um, but so I hope that helps. I cheated a bit on the second one, I'm afraid. Um, time for one more question. Probably one more, and then we're done. So, uh, should we come down, the, come down to the front, Daniel? Because these people have been waiting very patiently. There we go. There's a lady down here with a hand. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Have a T-shirt. What do you think about uh, the movement of scientists and the fact that they are using the Bible yeah, that's a good question, and I would say, fantastic. There's only one. There's only a couple of things I would say. One is wonderful because I think all God's, all truth is God's truth. So if evidence for some of that stuff comes up, wonderful. There was a, there was a story a few a uh, couple of years ago. For example, about some archaeologists who'd, uh, who, who'd been doing some, uh, some undersea photography in the Dead Sea and were wondering whether they'd found evidence of the of Red Sea rather than found evidence of the of the of the Exodus. It's jury still out on that one, but fantastic. And, and if they can do that, brilliant. The only thing I would say, the only caveat is this: don't peg your faith on the results of that study, because ultimately our faith doesn't hang on the results of, on the outcome of a scientific test. Right. It hangs on Jesus Christ. And so literally, if somebody, if somebody could prove to me, look, there's no evidence at all for anything in the Old Testament, I go, that's fine, I'm still prepared to trust it because Jesus did. Our faith is in him, not in, not in a scientific experiment. So as long with that caveat, wonderful. If they can find that kind of evidence, fantastic. I think at the end of the day, here's the interesting thing, we sometimes think as Christians, if the right piece of evidence can be found, it will convince the skeptic and everyone will become a Christian. I'm not saying you are saying that, but I'm saying we need to, we need to remember that's not the case. I always think it's very interesting if you go back to the Old Testament. One of the other reasons I trust the Old Testament to pick up on Chris's question is I think it has the ring of truth about it in places, a number of places. One is the fact the Israelites were a, bunch of, were, were a bunch of people who were always going off and not following God. To go, If you were writing and making up your own history, my word, you did a better job than we were, we were a bunch of slaves who couldn't follow a couple of simple commands. Um, but what's very interesting is if you look at the, the Mount Sinai story, you know, there are, there are the Israelites camped out at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Moses trots up the mountain, there's fire, there's earthquakes, there's all kinds of dramatic stuff going on. And what do they do? They build a flipping calf. And to go, here we have this miraculous theophany, and they reject God. So I think, the, ultimately, the, the, the primary human sin is idolatry. Whether it's the idolatry of worshipping other gods or whether it's worshipping ourselves, which is effectively atheism and putting the human race on a pedestal. And I think idolatry actually can sometimes blinker one's mind to any evidence. So we can, you know, we've probably had situations, many of us here, where we've given our friends the, walk them through the evidence for the resurrection perhaps, which is phenomenal. And you get to the end of that presentation, people go, yeah. Seriously, have you just not seen? Well, they haven't, because the eyes of their heart have not been opened. So I think, I think that kind of science, I love it, I excite it, I read that kind of stuff, I, 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 have a, I, I, I love it, I have to collect those kind of articles, but I hadn't picked up on that one, so I must, get the, I must look out for that. But it's also putting that in its place and going, our faith doesn't stand on it, but wonderful if they can find it, so all power to them. Well, thank you for listening so patiently, we're out of time, enjoy the last few hours of the day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. 
We pray you are richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at BreakForthMinistries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.